Okay, so this is officially the last video over rhetorical terms that I might share with you guys. Um, if I notice any patterns, I might review um, another one using examples. Um, but for now, I'm just going to talk about rhetorical distance. Um, so rhetorical distance is an effect of voice. And so this is kind of created through the language that the rhetor is using um, in their argument. Um, Rhetors can narrow or wide, widen the rhetorical distance between themselves and their audiences by means of stylistic choices. And so what do I mean when I say that rhetors can narrow or widen the rhetorical distance? Um, what this means is that a rhetor can create an intimate distance or intimacy with their audience. Um, through the use of their language choices. Um, again, if a rhetor is using a lot of slang or familiar language to their audience, or maybe they're sharing a lot of personal stories um, or saying a lot of things that the audience can really relate to, um, this is going to create a closer identification between the audience and the rhetor. Um, and it's also going to have more persuasive potential, right? Um, a formal distance, so this is when the rhetor widens uh, that distance between themselves and the audience, um, is when they're going to use a standoffish language maybe, or a very formal language, or language that's not familiar to the audience, um, or they're writing in more of an academic um, terms, and this is going to, of course, create less identification with the audience and have less persuasive potential. Um, so tools for creating intimacy. Um, when you are looking at your artifact, I highly recommend first off just printing it um, so you can annotate it like crazy. You can make marks, highlight patterns and things that you're seeing. Um, but something that you can go in is you can look for these um, following things in order to determine whether or not they're creating intimacy or if they're creating formal distance. So first and second pronouns. So they're using a lot of I, we, and us. Um, we need to do something. I feel this, right? Um, you, more attitude. Um, so there's more personality that's coming out. Um, David Sidaris does a really good job of this in his article, Letting Go. Um, there are informal word choices. So again, this is going to be slang um, or things that are going to be language that's more familiar to the audience. Um, the only pitfall with intimacy, so you could talk about this a little bit, right? Um, you could say, David Sedaris creates intimacy for smokers, right? But maybe he uses that you and we in a way that alienates readers who don't identify with this tension between smoking and not smoking. Um, ways that writers create more distance, um, they use third-person pronouns, um, so they sound very distant from the subject or the topic. They're kind of outside of the subject or topic. They have no personal narrative that they're sharing. They can't relate to this topic in any way. Um, they're very passive in the voice. They have less attitude. They're more objective, formal word choice or technical terms. Um, some An example of this would be an academic article. If you've ever read an, an article, article about um, theory or something that's very abstract, um, there's that distance between yourself and the writer or the author, which makes it really hard to be engaged with the text in the first place. Um, something that you're going to see is with, with that writer who's creating intimacy, you're going to be able to relate to the text in some way. You're going to feel the personal impact that this, te this um, subject has had on the writer. Um, I always like to use, if you've ever seen Braveheart, um, I like to use Braveheart as an example in my in-class presentations. Um, I play this clip from Braveheart where he's um, trying to rile up the troops to go and fight. And you see a lot of instances where he's creating that intimacy with his um, audience. He's saying, you know, sons of Scotland and we and, and I and, and you and just that attitude and that voice that's really in that speech in that moment. All right, so that is all I have um, over ethos, pathos, logos, and rhetorical distance.
Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to let me know. Um, you should be working on, let me go back to that slide, um, just drafting one to two terms using your article. Um, something that I want you guys to challenge you guys to do is don't just pick a term, do one example, one paragraph, and then next term, one paragraph. Um, again, that's going to give you that grocery list of things. Instead, I want to challenge you to really engage with these terms um, and try to find multiple examples of when the author is appealing to these different rhetorical terms. So find multiple instances of ethos. Um, invented and situated ethos can be separate terms, but they can also get you a lot, right, and, and as far as variety goes, for examples with ethos. Um, talk about different emotions, or maybe there's different instances where the author is making a pathetic appeal um, with the same, trying to evoke that same emotion in you as a reader. Um, all right, so if you have any questions, please let me know, and I really hope you made it this far in the video series.